Hey there. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Unsecurity Podcast. The date is October 14th, 2020. This is episode 101. I'm Evan Francine, your host, and join me uh, as my good friend and co-host, Brad Nye. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Evan. I know uh, we're a day late in getting the podcast out again this week, but cow, we've been busy. You and I talk offline, and there's just a lot of a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah we'll it, get on track, back on track next week, hopefully. Yeah, that's the plan. You know, like life just happens and work is nuts and what are you going to do? So you're saying security people have a life? I mean, maybe, no, I have a family, so, you know, family life gets nuts. I wouldn't say I necessarily have a life out of those. <laughs> and what what would uh you ever think what would life be like if you know as a security person if you didn't have your family oh i'm with i'm i'm the same as you like the, my family is what keeps me from like working around the clock right and that, I mean, it's such, that a, the it's anger. such a good buffer yeah yeah, because I wonder, because there are lots of people in our industry who don't have families, and I wonder, do they work more? I mean, I, I don't know. I if I didn't have a family, I would work all the time. Yep. No, I'm same. I just, I think, depends on how you're wired, you know? Yeah. Love what I do and passionate about it, so yeah, why wouldn't I do it? Right now on my task list, I have 65 things. I should share my task list someday. Maybe somebody will take something off of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a lot on mind. It's crazy. But if I didn't have family, I wonder if I would just keep working till my 65 things were done. Because then it just fills up with another 65 things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every time <laughs> one thing gets taken off, it's like two things get added. Yeah, and I don't think I'd be any more accomplished. I don't think I'd get any more impact done on the industry. I just think I'd die earlier. Yeah, probably. That's an interesting conversation about how important family is or something. That, you know, because I don't want to rip on the people that don't have families because you oh. don't have families. There's nothing wrong with that. But, my God, if I didn't have my family, I'd be screwed. Yeah, no, I think, well, like I said, everybody's a little, just a little different. You know, some people, that's just not what's right for them. But, you know, yeah. uh, like I said, it, it's kind of what anchors me. And We should have somebody that come on the show who doesn't have a family. We can find one. And who's kind of an A-type a personality in our industry and talk to them about this. Yeah. That'd be an interesting so wonder, conversation. I'm curious. It was different. Yeah, because I'm curious about it. How do you build margin? You know, I, I had a pastor once who told me how important it is to build margin in your life, which is like time for like, you know, not doing anything or just relaxing or whatever it is that's healthy. Yeah. Mm. I do know that if I didn't have family, I'd have a lot more toys. I wouldn't have more money, but I'd have more toys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point, man. I don't know. I don't know. I, I really like my family, so I don't think, you know, some people read into it, you know, could read into it. Well, you know, if you're sitting there thinking about what life would be like without your family, are you wishing you didn't have your family? And it's like, no, 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 no. Don't take it there. Yeah. I just wonder, like, without my wife, you know, how screwed would I be? Oh, I think pretty, pretty it would be screwed. bad <laughs> for, for both of us. Right? All right. We need, we need to have someone uh, to in our lives. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, real quick, just, you know, uh, well, actually, let's get to that in a minute. Yeah. I want to reiterate, you know, we did the last two podcasts about, you know, just kind of our review of The Social Dilemma. That's the Netflix documentary about social media. I saw another news article this morning um, 
about the very same thing and they were talking to, let's see if I can find it quick. Uh, his name, Tim Kendall. Remember Tim Kendall? He was the one who uh, was head of monetization at, at Facebook. Oh, yeah. I just saw something in the news today about, uh, it's interesting because this is a tie-in. Uh, the title of this article is ex-Facebook honcho Tim, Tim Kendall says big tech is a threat to democracy, calls for social media reform. I'm like, huh, we're talking about election security today, and we just talked about social dilemma the last two weeks. Yeah, and it was totally on accident. I was just getting ready to take a shower this morning and opened up the news. I was like, oh, interesting. Hmm. But I liked it so much. I actually liked that because I love when things like spur thoughts in my mind, you know, it makes me think like, yeah. wow, has my reality been different than I thought it was? Or uh, is there a different perspective that I didn't consider, you know, as I form my own reality in my mind? And that's the thing, right, with people. We, if you've got 7 billion people, you know, in the, in the world, Really, when you think about it, are there 7 billion realities walking around? Because we all have our own perception of things. Yeah, I'd say so. Weird, right? Mind blown. <laughs> it's, but somehow, somehow the 7 billion realities all have to be weaved together to create, you know, yeah. this. Mm-hmm. Freaky man, we're really really going glad. down this path. You're, you're way too, it's way too deep to be talking about it. Or I don't know. Way too early to going that deep. <laughs> but I think that's a reason why I want to watch that documentary again. Is I just want to like, you know, kind of sit there and stew on that a bit more. But anyway, seven billion realities, because that's one of the things that just frustrates the crap out of me, man. I, you know, there's try obviously now what dominates the headlines is Trump and Biden. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the other, you know, stuff on around the outside, like, you know, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, I think it's her yep. name. The, uh, Supreme court stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You've got, you know, this other ancillary stuff, but the core of it all right now is Biden and Trump. And, um, you know, I was, I read things and I read it. I try to be as non-biased as possible, but we're all biased, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, it, it's you much, not. I, there are certain biases you have. It's just human nature. You can't not. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and, and I like to think that it's good to be able to reflect on, you know, what your biases might be and are the decisions I'm making based on those biases. You know, um, yeah. I mean, that, that, I see this. Oh, go ahead. That, that, that might be part of the like that next level of 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 the biases is being aware of what they are, and you know, being cognizant of those when you're doing things, right? Because, like you said, yeah. we all have different backgrounds. We've all come up different ways. It it just shapes who you are, which builds in some biases, but that doesn't mean that that's not always a negative. Right, right. And I think if you can, for me, it seems to help if I can pull myself, if I recognize bias, pull myself out of it, try to pull, you know, try to change the my, my mind on is what this person saying making sense. Mm -hmm. Just at face value. Forget about where they're coming from. Forget about their background. Forget about whether they're from is saying makes sense and can I fact check it? Because I, I, cause I was doing that this yesterday. There was a, a talk about the Latino vote. Um, and one side was saying, uh, you know, playing the Despacito thing when Biden did that. Mm. I don't know if you saw that clip, but, um, 
how that was pandering to the Latino vote. And, you know, you got to give Latinos more credit than that. They have, you know, they have a head on their shoulders. And, and then I was watching, and that came from like a UFC fighter, uh, Jorge Masvidal, I think is his name. And so I was like, well, you know, you got a point, you know. Uh, so then I start reading the comments on this tweet. It's like, the comments on the tweet are not, they're, they take their side, polar opposites, left or right, Biden or Trump. And it's like they didn't even watch the video. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why I overall just I avoid social media as much as possible. <laughs> right. But if they did watch the video and then they still have these comments, it's like, are you that stuck in your in, in ideology and your bias that you will not accept any other point of view anymore? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's like That's a dangerous about. spot to be because then then you become radical. That's a radical. Yeah. Well, and that's what we've talked about is with with social media. It's it's they the with their algorithms, you know, it's like, oh, you like this, so I'm going to show you more of this. And it's like, it's that, lack of a better phrase, death spiral, right? It's a, the echo chamber where it does, it just amplifies those extreme views. Right. Because the thing I don't want to be, I want to stick to my, my values because I, my values are who, are what sort of make me who I am and, and they're the, the one I stand on, right? When the world is pushing you around, it's like I got my values. And then, so I try to stick to that, but then God forbid, I don't ever want to be a radical. So I don't want to get so stuck in my mind that I'm closed minded to other points and other thoughts. But I see so much of that today. Yeah. Just so much like, I don't care if what you could be hitting me right upside the head with some of the most impactful facts that that uh, on something, but if it goes against theology, if it goes against my made up mind, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If anything, if anything, I might come out fighting. Right? It's like putting a, putting a cat into a corner; they're gonna come out <laughs> ready to kill. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. It. Yeah. <laughs> it's nuts, man. So. Yeah. All right, catch, catching up. How you doing? How's how's your week? How's uh, you know how's work? Good. It's uh, some cool stuff yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of wrapping up some things from Q3 and identifying some new free resources and tools that I'm gonna start developing here over the next. You know, deliver something this quarter and just keep moving forward with that. So I'm pretty excited about some of that. Have a big project, probably a. 40 to 50 hour project that kicked off mo uh, Monday that has to be done this month for a customer. So I kind of stepped in and helping out. So that, that'll be good around Office 365 hardening and stuff like that. Um, impressed that they, they have, they are using the email only at this point and wanted to come in and, and be proactive on making sure they have all their configuration set properly. You know, what can they do before they migrate everybody to using, you know, SharePoint and OneNote and all the additional uh, services. So I, I'm really happy that they're being proactive about it. Um, nice. It could be, it's going to be so fun. They're, they're, so they're actually talking about security at the front end of the project. Pretty much. Yeah. Like I said, they, they went to the, to email, which, you know, you know, email online versus on-prem really isn't a huge difference in terms of right. some of the stuff, but the others would be new services they're going to offer their employees. So yeah, they're being proactive with that. And then um, also doing the, you know, the election security for the, the Minnesota counties, that's going really well. Been really happy with every, it's been, eye-opening in a good way like it's not what i was expecting and that's a 
kind of, uh, and I don't want to sound negative about that, but yeah, it's been really energizing, encouraging maybe. I don't know what the right word is. Apparently it's an E word though. Um, <laughs> but just talking with, with all these things. Enticing. Right. Evan's an E word. Evan's an E word. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's going really well. And then next week we have our uh, quarterly VTL. So that'll be awesome to start planning for 2021. And um, it's uh, my calendar for the rest of the month is completely full. So that's good, good problem to have, but a little chaotic. Yeah. So that's, well, this is fourth quarter, right? This is how fourth quarter works in much of our industry. Yes. You know, the, um, yeah, and, and you and I talked about, you know, that, that project you have coming up or that, you know, you're just starting, that's, that's exciting. There's always, I mean, it's cool to see you getting back into projects a little bit too, because you've kind of taken you for a while, you were doing kind of more innovation stuff, creating things, uh, leading you know, other analysts and, and stuff like that. So it's good to see, you know, every once in a while, it's nice to get and actually, you know, for sure. Like, a little bit. you know, I've kept a couple of uh, VC so clients, but they're pretty low maintenance clients. It's, it's good. I mean, they're in really good shape, so that's nice, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's good to just keep stay in the game. Make sure you're what, what you're doing is actually still relevant and that, you know, you're not falling behind, right? staying on top of things. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for me, it's been um, a couple of talks this last week. Yesterday I gave a talk. It was kind of a, an impromptu talk. I was invited to a pretty large public company to speak to their team. And I think we're 43 people online and that team and it was it was truly impromptu it was like uh, I was pinged on it on Thursday like hey <laughs> Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. can you come talk to our team it's Cybersecurity awareness month and blah 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 and I'm like and it's a friend of mine you know the, the CEO I'm like yeah man of course I can do that so I moved things around uh, did that talk yesterday that was awesome because it was the second time I'd given that talk because I didn't I'm not going to create a whole new slide deck for this so I just used uh, the simplification slide deck that I used for um, a bunch of uh, colleges like 50 or so colleges or whatever that was last week so uh, and then you know my dog died last week so that threw last week off kind of just funky but um, created this s2 index which We'll do a release on that pretty soon. The marketing people have to make it pretty because they'll make things pretty. <laughs> uh, got a nice peek at your fact version two. And so for fact, for listeners, your fact is uh, the way we do VC. So virtual chief information security officer at, uh, at FR secure. And uh, you shared that with me yesterday. I thought it looked really, really good. Um, I'm excited to dig in, you know, a little bit more on that. Uh, had lunch with Pat Joyce last week. Mm -hmm. He's the CISO for Medtronic. One of my favorite people. I mean, I can't I just love that guy. He's so, he, he's an exceptional, exceptional leader. And, you know, being able to, you know, have lunch with him and uh, just share thoughts. We were talking about mental health on, uh, you know, in security teams. And how would you know if one of your people is struggling with, Mental health. So that was a really good talk. I mean, it was just a lot of really good security stuff going on, a lot of good conversations. And then you got the the day to day administrative BS that comes up. So you got to, you know, deal with that. Yeah, that's the part yeah. I don't like. Like, so and so is upset about some, you know, such and such. <laughs> and you know, our culture is so so important to us that you have to ask those things. But people are people, right? I mean, humans are humans, and they have issues with other things and but it's just such a pain in the ass. It's like kids, you know, sometimes. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know. 
Uh, so that's distracting. I got one of those things. Uh, actually, when I got the call last night about or a text last night, uh, and it's nothing big, it's, but it's just like, uh, and, it, and they're never big. They're usually petty. It's disruptive. Stuff, you know. Oh. Right. You have to stop what you're doing to do yeah. something else. And it's petty, but you know what? If you don't care of things, it should, and it, a lot of that's just like security, like life. If you don't take care of the petty things, they'll become big things potentially, yep. and you really would have taken care of it when you when you learned about it. Yep, I agree, hundred percent. All right, so we're both busy as hell. Is hell, is hell busy? Why do we come up with that? Who came up with that saying? I'm thinking oh. too much today. I know, you're, you're really like deep in uh, philosophizing. I don't know what the, I think it's all the election rap, man. It's, it's all like, hmm, huh, that's not a bad point, but you're not somebody who's going to vote for the person I'm going to vote for, probably. <laughs> I don't know, it's just weird. All right, so let's talk about election security. As you know, uh, today, we're 20 days. Yesterday was three weeks. We are 20 days away from the election. If you haven't registered to vote yet, and I'm speaking to the listeners and you, Brad, I'm sure you've registered, um, go out and register to vote. Yeah. You should. It is a civic duty. It is something that we're all supposed to do. You can't really complain. Even if you think your vote is insignificant, if everyone thought that, then nobody would vote and we'd have a dictatorship. Right. Yeah. So, well, and you don't get to complain if you didn't vote. That's what I've always do, man. It's like you can't complain about the president if you didn't vote for the president or against the president or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, get out and vote. Easy, quickest place that you can. I mean, there's lots of places you can go to register. The one that I uh, would recommend would be vote.gov. So, if you just go https colon slash slash vote.gov, that's where you can register. So, uh, and you get to you get to keep your own vote. They're supposed to be somewhat anonymous, right? You don't yep. have to tell anybody who you voted for. So, yep. you know, you don't have to do that. Yeah. People should respect people should respect your right to that. So somebody's pan. You know, I don't know if you've had anybody ask you well, who you voting for, who you vote for. Other than my wife, nobody asked me that. Either they don't yeah. care, or they know that I'm just going to be like, I'm telling you who I'm voting for. Yeah, I don't, I don't really, outside of like a, you know, close circle of friends that, it, that it's not really a secret or whatever, however you want to put it. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, no, I haven't, I, no, I haven't really had that this, this time. I've, I've had it happen in the past, but you know, maybe because we're all remote, it's a little different dynamic, but no, I haven't had it really anybody ask me. So the date is November 3rd. That's yeah. Tuesday, three weeks from yesterday. Uh, yeah, please, please vote. It's interesting. You know, I don't know if you get turned off. I get actually pretty irritated when I have people who can't relate to a single thing that I go through in my life other than maybe taking a dump and eating food. Who try to tell me who to vote for, right? You have all these... Uh, uh, celebrities, uh, you know, sports people, people that in a totally different world than I live, right? You talk about different realities, 7 billion realities. Their reality ain't close to mine. Right. Right. The yeah. pandemic didn't, didn't bother you all that much other than the fact, that, I don't know, you live in your mansion and you have people that go out and got food for you anyway. You never had to do any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to tell me who to vote for. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I and you talk about it, it, bias. It, it, if you talk about bias, what do you think their bias is? Do you think they really give a shit me? Uh, you know, well, I, that, use my language. I don't, I don't know, right? That's it, that's their right is to say, hey, here's who I'm supporting. That's part well, of it. You I get know. that. So I, whether you agree with it or not, I think it's it is. What's good is, uh, or one of the things that's yeah. good, is that they have the ability to speak freely about this stuff. You wouldn't see that in 
you know, in Russia or China. And I do like that fact. I like the supporting thing. What I don't like is attacking the other side thing yep. or uh, that I agree when it becomes negativity. more than just supporting. Yeah. But yeah, no, I already voted a mailed in ballot uh, last week and nice. Ready to go. So you're, you're, you're ahead. Yeah, we did it um, two years ago, I guess. Uh, as well, or whenever the last, I get well, every year, but the, the big ones, we've done the uh, mail-in. And it's been great here in Minnesota. You know, everybody gets their own barcode on their envelope. And I actually, for the primaries, I put the wrong um, identifier. I uh, just forgot what, you know, what, what the, you know, they have multiple things that they, you can put when you register to uh, do the absentee ballots. And I forgot which one I did. And they actually called and emailed and said, hey, there was a problem with this and took care of it. It was phenomenal. I was really impressed with, uh, with how that went, you know, because I registered like in March and <laughs> forgot. That's really, because there's so many, uh, you know, I didn't realize that it was, because I'm not, voting that way i'm i'm gonna go to the polling station uh and i'll wear my mask and be responsible and all that stuff but the um you if so much of the news is like it's chaos right it's so yeah. cor it's corrupt and all this other stuff but that sounds pretty you know it, fluid and, and secure and having worked with a, a bunch of these counties i mean here's the thing is like i said you you have specific steps you have to follow Right. So there is the opportunity for making a mistake, right? You have to put it inside the privacy envelope. Then you have to put that inside the signature envelope and fill out your information. And like I said, I made a mistake in the primaries and, and, but they were able to contact me because right, I, you have to put your, you know, how do you get contact when you register for that? Uh, but yeah, the, the signature envelope has a barcode on it. And so you didn't, even if somebody were to try to cast multiple votes, the system's only going to count one. That's the way it's built. You know, so if, if that barcode for that person has been processed, that's it. The other, any others that would may come in are going to get rejected. So if I were to try to go in person on November 3rd, it, it wouldn't work. And there's a, you know, the state of Minnesota has a, really nice website where you can go and put in your information and use the different uh, things and see where your ballot is. Have they received it? Has it been processed? Has it, was it accepted? You know, so I, I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there and there's a lot of, you know, uh, obviously there's, there's opportunities for mistakes to happen, but the security overall for the, the, absentee ballots is is really pretty solid from from what I've seen. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> that's like the saying the saying of twenty twenty. You're on mute. Yeah. Well and that's the uh that's in Minnesota. Uh is it run differently in other states? Do other states and every other counties in other states have different approaches to it? To some extent, but you know, overall, from what I've seen, it's it's very similar with having the barcode and having the privacy envelope and the signature envelope, and you know, requiring uh, it, you know, some states require a witness, so you have to have somebody else sign that they saw you do this. Um, but as far as I know, it's the the they have that barcode in place uh, kind of system to prevent these things from happening, from not allowing multiple votes to, to be processed for a single person. Okay. Well, I've seen, you know, we've heard stories of, uh, about, you know, ballot stuffing where, you know, maybe I can take somebody's vote and change it or, you know, gather a whole bunch of old people that wouldn't normally vote and coerce them into voting for my candidate and then taking those things in. 
uh, you know, so I think there's, there's always to be, um, I think, uh, an opportunity for fraud in anything. Yeah, but I agree. Uh, and, you know, but what you see is you, you do hear about these stories where somebody gets caught. And to me, it just shows and indicates that the system is working, right? Mm -hmm. These things are not actually have, being, they're being caught. That, that's what you would want to see. Like somebody's trying to do something they shouldn't and they got caught. That, that in, to me shows that, that those checks and balances are in place to ensure that it is done well. And, you know, you've got states that have been doing vote by mail for, you know, I think what Colorado or Washington state has been doing it for over 10 years and not had any issues. Like there's security measures in place and tampering with the mail is a federal offense and you do not want to mess with the postal inspectors. Those guys are no joke. So, <laughs> postal inspectors, right? Yeah. Like, you know, they, they have their own enforcement wing. They have their own police service basically. And yeah, tampering with the federal they carry the guns. Mail. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, they you can read stories about it. They they are no no joke. They are very, very serious about their stuff. So uh, you So know, that's one so okay, go ahead. I know, I was just gonna say that's just another level of of protection that's in there. Right, it's built in. Yeah, and hopefully there is some consistency across, you know, the different counties or districts, you know, across the United States. But it sounds like Minnesota's got things pretty well squared away. And I really like the fact that they engaged security experts to come and them uh, each county, and the state actually I think arranged for it. Mm -hmm. To do it at no cost or low cost so that no cost to the counties to um, do they just fill out the risk assessment and they get a 30 minute you know conversation no cost to them cool. it's been really yeah. really good that's awesome man it, i wonder what we, what we can learn from that can we learn something from this to do you know after the election you know what things can we do for counties for states or not for counties cities municipalities after this yeah the uh, way the way that we're doing this election security thing i would say right now based on and and it's a it's a still a i will i would say relatively small sample size but based on my conversations to this point there the the one consistent theme that i'm seeing is well i guess two but one is these, these people truly care. They are very passionate about what they do. They're very much aware of where some of those holes are. They, like I've gone through this and none of them have been surprised by what the, the results have been, you know, and they don't see it until we have this call, right? So they're not, they don't have any prep. They just filled out a questionnaire. Um, but the biggest issue has been, uh, capacity they're like you know budget it's it's the same thing you would have at you know schools and things like that is yeah I, I i know that this is a weakness i just don't have time to do it i need more staff or i need i know i need these tools i just can't afford it and so you know how do we maybe you know and, and that's kind of that you're talking about with, or we were talking about with some of the things that are coming. It's that mission before money approach is building out some of these tools for, uh, you know, schools and counties and, and small businesses to be able to leverage at no cost that is, that are going to increase uh, their security, reduce their risk. Right. All right. Well, so, um, your mail-in ballots, those, that's one way to do elections. Now, I found some resources online that I think are pretty cool about election security. I was surprised to see, you know, how many actual quality resources there are. Um, and I listed them on, you know, in our show notes. We have the election infrastructure security, you know, site from C The uh, election security from the Department of Homeland Security has a nice 
cite uh, another one from the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Um, and then there's even one from uh, DNI, the uh, National Counterintelligence and Security Center, Foreign Threats to U.S. Law. So good resources there. You know, even the first one, right? If you look at CISA, so if you don't know who CISA is, it's the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It's part of the Department of Homeland Security. They usually have some pretty good resources. Mm -hmm. And just October 7th, they, they released, uh, actually October 2nd, they released Election Disinformation Toolkit, which I thought was kind of cool, like a toolkit about disinformation. And it's uh, meant to help election officials uh, communicate well as a trusted voice uh, to spread the importance that we are all in this together, despite the partisan BS that we're all bombarded with every day. Uh, we're trying to reduce the impacts of disinformation campaigns on the elections. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Uh, what, and then what's they really cool about uh, well, Real quick, with CISA, um, is that they do free, no-cost vulnerability scans for government agencies. So, like, all the now, There used to be... Oh, sorry. Wasn't there a big... Wasn't there a big, uh, like waiting list for that has that been resolved it's from what i've heard the people that uh the, the counties have not had any issues okay, okay. yeah it, it's automated and you get like weekly reports so you just have to email in and request it and then so if you're a government cities uh, county government state government <laughs> take advantage of that 100% take advantage of that. And there's another, yeah. So, because we, we hear a lot too about, you know, election, how elections can be hacked, right, mm -hmm. from nation state. And I don't, so, so much of that is overblown. Yes, the machines can be hacked. Just about anything with, that you have physical access to can be hacked. Uh, the code running on a lot of election machines can be hacked. The thing is, is can I get to it? And can I get to it in mass? Right? Mm. Yep. Can I get to 50 election machines when the 50 election machines are run by sort of 50 agencies or 50 different counties? And, you know, I mean, they're, they're just independent. They're not all, it's not like I can go after one central, you can, but it's not, that's that part is very very well protected well and and th those the actual ballot machines are on separate networks they're you know basically like call home to only a specific thing they're offline until you know they need to call home now that's not all of them but that is you know there are some that are like that and so yeah it would be a massive massive undertaking could it be done sure but is it likely I don't think so. Well, and could it be done without detection? Right. No, I don't know how you could I, possibly do it without detection. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think you would be, it would be uh, pretty obvious. Right. And so I think where you've seen, and who, and who would have the motivation to do that other than, you know, the partisan people who don't have, probably don't have the skills or the resources anyway. So we're talking probably a nation state, right? Mm -hmm. Russia, China, Iran. And even if they had the capabilities, what would be, and they, they might, but doubtful. Uh, what would, what's, what's easier for them to just engage in disinformation campaigns? Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's exactly what I was going Actual say. election boxes. It, it's going to be more beneficial for them to spread that disinformation and so the uncertainty and doubt, right? That the FUD that we talk about. Um, so I think that that's probably their bigger, they're the more, well, it, what we talk about, uh, right? Hackers are, they're going after, these attackers are going the path of least resistance, right? That's just the reality of what they do. They're not going to, what's the, what's going to get them what they are looking for with the least amount of work. It's not going to be hacking individual 
polling sites or things like that. It's going to be spreading the disinformation to start with. Right. It's basically it. social engineering, right? Is is really what it comes down to? Is there are they going to do technical hacking or social engineering? What's the easier way in? It's always through the people, not the technology. Right. Right. Well, and, and you thought you would have thought we would have learned some of this from 2016, that election, because we uncovered a bunch of disinformation campaigns. We knew how the adversaries, at least in that election, how many of them were trying to influence the election. And, and you do see, like, you know, Twitter and Facebook just deactivated a huge number of Russian accounts that were spreading disinformation. So right. I think there we have learned from it, but it's not proactive yet. It's still reactive um, in finding these things. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So there's a, you know, to close this out, I think there's a lot more to election security than just infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, we do have, we do have voter intimidation. We've seen evidence of that. I don't know if even that's as widespread as the news might make you feel like it is. Um, where I'm going to be voting, uh, I'm fairly certain that there won't be any voter intimidation. Um, and I think in most cases, for most people, you won't be intimidated. Now, understand it's your right. If you don't want to tell somebody who you vote, voted for, don't. Right. A lot of the intimidation comes from the fact that you know that I'm voting for not your guy, right? And yep. you're so passionate and kind of, you know, wound up into that ideology of that guy that you know, you're going to intimidate me for voting for not your guy. So yeah. Yeah. just avoid it if you can. Yeah. The disinformation absolutely is 100% there, right? That is the way elections are influenced. That's the way. And, and it's like, if you read all the stuff, you you've, I think most people without, most people are just so confused about was this a fact or not a fact? I mean, it's just like, it's crazy. Yep. Yeah, there's just so much to try and process. It's like, how do you filter what's real, what's made up? Yep. And it, which goes back to it, the social dilemma stuff that we were talking about. Right, but it, even out of the mouths of the candidate, which has always been that way anyway, but it's straight up lies right. on both sides. I mean, we talk about the presidential election. It's, it's not just Trump who's lying. Way. Oh my, no, it's straight up lies, man, because lot, the truth is binary. I don't know why people, in most cases, right, it might be a bunch of binary, so then it looks gray, but it's still binary. Uh, yeah. All right, and what, what about all this stuff after election night, too, man? I'm kind of nervous about, all right, you know, the polls close on November 3rd or November 4th. What now? You know, I, yeah, honestly, regardless of who being voted for, I just want it to be clear on election night. I don't want this dragging on for another two, three, four, six weeks after. I just want it to be done with. I'm <laughs> like, I'm over this. Yeah. Well, this is, I think the first election in my life, you know, and I'm f almost 50. This is the first election in my lifetime where I actually have a little bit of fear regardless of who wins just because yeah. we're so polarized you know if if trump wins there's a whole bunch of people on the left that are radical that will cause a whole bunch of trouble man and if biden wins there's a whole bunch of people on the right that are radical you know i mean it's just like yeah oh, for for a centrist for somebody who really wants people to work yeah. together on That's things why, i think the only the only hope that I see with some of that stuff is, is a landslide type victory where once I can't really claim and fight it and put it in, you know, like, let the, let the people talk and, and then see what happens versus, well, we're going to take it to court and it's going to be six weeks. It's going to, we don't know it's coming up on Christmas and nobody knows what's happening. You know? So, and I'm with you though. I, it's, it's unfortunate. It really, really is that, we've gotten to this point. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think 
uh, going back again, tying it back into the social dilemma. I mean, that that's part of why we're here is, is that they feed that echo chamber. They feed and, and help do that. And it, it sucks. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of times we've sold ourselves out without realizing we sold ourselves out. Yeah. You know, and I hope there's a, a day of opening. All right, well, and uh, we'll be talking more about disinformation too on Thursday night's shit show, so that, that would be fun. We've done a little bit of research for that, uh, but there's just so much out there. Oh yeah. Okay, well, good discussion. Securing an election certainly, I, you know, hasn't been any more difficult than this today. The 2020 election is uh, a hard one to secure when you talk about, you know, all the different ways to influence or, you know, hack in quotes uh, an election. Let's catch up on some news quick. Here are some uh, here's some recent news that I thought was sort of interesting. <laughs> Anytime I see John McAfee in the news, yeah. it always makes me giggle because, and that guy is a is a, is a character. Uh, so this comes from Graham Cluey. Uh, the title is John McAfee arrested on U.S. tax evasion charges. That's the other group you don't mess with is the IRS. Postal inspectors and the IRS, they will get you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. NSA, CIA, eh. Postal inspectors, IRS, yeah. You don't mess with people's money. Or mail, I guess. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting that McAfee, you know, he bumps up in the news every once in a while and uh, he was arrested in Spain, yeah. tax evasion charges. Allegedly, there's what, 24, I think, ish million dollars in the SEC complaint that was filed against him of unclaimed uh, earnings, revenue, yeah, whatever. Yeah, from cryptocurrency. Right. So this is the same McAfee for people that, you know, are haven't been around for a long time. This is the same McAfee that founded the antivirus company, but he left that in the 90s. So still so has his name, but he has nothing to do with the company anymore. But he's, yeah. he's an interesting character. He's done a lot of just weird stuff. Yeah. He's a, he, a, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if I put him in, hmm. I don't know if I put him in the. He was. He would not be somebody that I would want in my circle, just because it's so many things seem just reckless. But it's. I don't know. It's interesting to watch. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. So anyway, if you want to go read about it, uh, if you want to know about the fifty-five page complaint, it is public. It's. Uh, it's on the docket. Um, yeah. Who's back in the news? And this is the same guy, by the way, that, you know, and in that news story, you know, he was, he was, I think, um, he was wanted, wanted for questioning in a murder in Belize. And then a whole bunch of other stuff. He, he was running as a president, yeah. presidential candidate in 2016. He, he is a colorful character. He really is. So. I thought that was interesting just because his name always catches my this one you could do a whole show on this one we could do a whole series of shows on this one because this keeps popping up uh and this is uh, from the register five eyes nations plus japan india and india call for big tech to bake back doors into everything such a nightmare here we are here we are again so the five eyes, if you don't know that security alliance, it's Australia, Canada, New Zealand, US, and the UK. So, yeah. And also, of course, Australia is, they already built back doors into all their encryption, I think, didn't they, last year? Um, yeah, I don't know if they, I think they passed something that said they were going to. I don't know if it actually is in effect yet. Yeah, and us as normal citizens, we're kind of caught in the middle of this crap, right? Because big tech, they have their own motivations, their own reasons for doing mm -hmm. the things that they do. They, co they come off like, well, we don't want to give you a back door because then it would violate potentially people's privacy. But the th I know enough about big tech that they don't care about your privacy. They only care about privacy enough to give you the illusion that they care about your privacy. That's different. Yeah, no, it's, 
PR for them, right? Hey, we're protecting you from these things to some extent, right? If they, it, you don't want that negative press and people leaving your uh, right. infrastructure or whatever, whatever, however you want to put it. Yeah. And, but us as cons consumers, we're stuck in the middle, like big tech. Yeah, they're going to use this as a PR play to come off like, no, we're standing in government because we care about you. And government is like, well, we, I assume we want these back doors so that we can protect, you know, our citizens better and, you know, root out criminal activity more. And then, you know, us as like normal person sitting in my home, I'm like, whatever i mean i don't want you to read my stuff right but that's not the perp that's not the reason why you're fighting over this stuff anyway so it's like we're just caught in the middle of whatever they're going to decide yep i don't like back doors because back doors are always abused period yep i th yeah agreed you might go into this with the best of intentions ever ever to put this back door but once you've gone down this path it's just a matter of time for somebody else in your team or in your organization is going to yeah it's going to yeah. abuse it all right that's what humans do uh all right so that's that one verizon uh 25 percent only 20 according to verizon their pci dss report you know verizon's big into that game this is also from the register just 25% of global businesses fully comply or comply fully with the payment card industry data security standard. I mean, it's not, not a surprise. surprise. And what's no. really, really frustrating is that these companies are getting basically that rubber stamp from some of these QSA companies. I mean, oh, we've seen oh, it man. where we, we come in afterwards and we're like, whoa, time out what in the world is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. There are fraudulent, you know, newsflash, not for you, but for people, there are fraudulent information security consulting companies in our industry. I mean, yeah. I've seen it. There's a reason that some of those QSA companies are, you know, having to have every single one of the rocks they do manually reviewed and having to prove that they're doing it. There's a reason for that. Right. Yeah, it's sad too, because even if you spend millions of dollars and become PCI compliant in the breach, which again, you can't not have breaches. It's, it's risk management, not risk elimination. Just having this exposes you at some level Right, so PCI DSS is meant to, I don't know if it's meant for this, but the best it can be used for is to reduce risk, reduce mm -hmm. something bad, you know, the likelihood and or impact of something bad happening, but you can't eliminate it. And so no. I've been in a breach too that, like take Target for instance, they had their breach, they were PCI DSS compliant, they were, uh, you know, their QSA and ROC was issued by um, oh God, I can't even remember, think of the name now, but it was the biggest player. Yeah. Where, where's, my, uh, where's my brain? Anyway, they, uh, but they were deemed to be non PCI compliant after, after the breach. And that's the, that's the racket uh, with PCI way. DSS, by the way, trust wave. There you go. That's the racket with PCI compliance. You can be assessed and have your rock and do all the things that you think you were supposed to be doing, and then you experience a breach, you will be found that you were not PCI compliant mm -hmm. after the breach. That's the way PCI, that's the way the, the council plays the game with not having to take liability uh, for PCI compliance. But anyway, that's a whole nother bit. Yeah. All right, and the last one, hackers disguise malware attack as new details on Donald Trump's COVID-19 illness. This comes from Tripwire. And it's not surprising to me at all. We see that no. every single disaster, natural disaster, whatever, this is what we see. Exactly, and that's, that's the reason why I pulled it out is, um, yeah, this is just consistent behavior that happens from 
uh, from attackers, right? Donald Trump, you know, is found to have COVID and somehow you start getting emails that say, hey, you know, do something about this, you know, or whatever that you didn't get before. I mean, that's just how attackers work, right? Whatever's top of the news, expect attacks related to that. Yeah. Word? Yeah. All right. So great episode. That's 101. It's uh, just about complete. Thanks, Brad. Do you have any shout outs for this week? Uh, you know, I think I'll, I'll give a shout out to our PM CSM RM team. They've been doing just a great job it, with some transitions and, and realignments and then just keeping everybody in line and myself included, which is never an easy task. So They've been doing a really good job. So shout out to them. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I'm just going to, you know, we started, you know, I didn't really think of my shout outs until we started podcast. Uh, we talked about family. I'm just going to give a shout out to my family because, you know, thank God for my family or I'd be in dead jail. So appreciative. Yeah, that's, that's another good one. Keep unjailing me, please. Because if you unjail, is that different than de-jail? Is de-jail bail? I don't know. Whole other thing again. You're just in All a right. philosophizing mood. I know, man. Just lock me in a room somewhere and give me a pen and piece of paper and I'll come up with something stupid. All right. Always grateful for our listeners. We're, we are behind on email. At least I am. I don't know if Brad's gone and checked lately, but uh, we will promise to respond soon. Send things to us by email at unsecurity at protonmail.com. If you're the social type, socialize with us on Twitter. I'm at Evan Francine and Brad's at Brad Nye. Lastly, be sure to follow Security Studio uh, at Studio Security and FR Secure at FR Secure for more things that we do. Uh, we'll be creating more stuff, giving away more stuff, I'm sure. Uh, but that's it. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>